Getting to know Jasmine Simone on Pro Cuddle Hustle podcast. My guest is a delight. When you finish listening to this, you will have a wonderful rest of your day. That is the impact that Jasmine has. And if you don't know who she is, Jasmine Simone is the founder of Tanjay Wellness and she's a seasoned platonic, platonic touch practitioner and human connection facilitator. She helps adults overcome loneliness and depression through transformative healing techniques. Doesn't that sound awesome? Jasmine is committed to revolutionizing the therapeutic touch industry and is the driving force behind the Platonic Touch Academy, a pioneering institution dedicated to training future practitioners in our field. You may recognize her because she has been interviewed on other podcasts. She is located in the Washington, D.C. area. For those outside of the United States, that is the capital of the U.S. Here is Jasmine. How do you say cuddling in your language? We're stuck in legal limbo because sex work isn't decriminalized yet. Why is there a Wikipedia page for cuddle parties but not for professional cuddling? No, Felicity, it's facilitator, not felicitator. It's not a replacement for therapy, but it is therapeutic. I am here on this lovely morning with the one and only Jasmine Simone. Did I pronounce your last name correct? It's Simon, but you can just call me Jasmine or Jazzy Pants. (laughs) My name is Felicity and my audience already knows who I am, but I would like you to have the floor. My name is Jasmine Simon. Uh, I'm originally from Sacramento, but I've been in the DC area since 2005. I am a platonic touch practitioner, and that is I offer touch utilizing professional cuddling, partner yoga, and polyvagal movement, uh, which actually is no touching in polyvagal movement, but more embodiment work, getting people to feel comfortable in their body, alone with their thoughts. Uh, That's primarily for people who have phobias around touch or have trauma. And I have my offices here in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right on the DC, Maryland line. And then I have a second office where I see clients that's about 170 miles south in Williamsburg, Virginia. So Southern Virginia. Yeah, it usually takes me, I leave early in the morning when I go down there because I go down there once a month for a day or two to see clients. If I leave at 5, 5.30 in the morning, it takes me two and a half hours to get down there. If I leave any time <laughs> after 6 or 7 a.m., it's a four-hour drive, four and a half, five hours if it's raining or if there's an accident. I'm very rigid about making sure that I leave on time so I'm not sitting in traffic. And because I get there and I'm immediately seeing clients, I start my sessions at 8. The last one will end about 8. There aren't very many people doing professional cuddling, and I know that I have a lot of experience. So sometimes, I don't know if you've seen, I've posted a few things on social media, media about certifications and training. I I offer something that they can't access. So they're always very appreciative to have me there. It's incredibly rewarding. I am not familiar with polyvagal therapy, but to me, it sounds very much like somatic healing. Is there any difference? No, I think there's a lot of similarity in it. Uh, Somatic healing is not just for trauma, right? It's a feeling into your body. It's There's a lot of overlap. Same with mindfulness, a lot of overlap there as well, creating awareness within your body. Before I start a session with a client, I do a body scan meditation, five to eight minutes, sometimes 10, to really help the client relax and get in tune with their body. Because most people come in, especially if it's their first time, you know, I always make a joke about people coming in and like standing standing in the corner with their hands like this, like it's a court ordered appointment that they have to be here for therapy just because it's people can be very apprehensive, not quite sure what to expect. And so that body scan helps them to get used to my voice, get used to the space, relax a little bit. Well, that sounds copacetic. I think so. Over here on the West Coast, a lot of people who learn somatic healing go to the Somatic Institute of, it's either in Cupertino or Sunningville. Is there a somatic healing institute near you or do they go by a different name? No, I think somatic healing, somatic therapy is probably the same across the country. There might be one here. I'm sure there probably is, but I don't know of it or where it is or I've never been to (laughs) A lot of therapeutic professionals offer virtual sessions. I've never offered virtual cuddles. Is remote therapy something that you offer? 
I do, yeah, yeah. I do offer virtual, well, I call them virtual holding space sessions because we're not really touching. There's a lot of self-soothing touch that people do to themselves. I have a very relaxing, calming voice. I'll sometimes tell a story or sometimes I'll whisper ASMR or use my intimacy cards and go make different sounds. I'll typically have someone give me a topic and then just start telling a story based off of the topic. If they say walking down a beach or seeing the love of your life for the first time or whatever, whatever topic it might be. And so I'll sit there and tell a story. Other times people just want to come in and talk on the floor, like what you're giving me right now. Take the floor and talk about those things they haven't been able to talk about. They're lonely. No one's listening. No one's asking questions. And if they are listening and asking questions, that's going to be turned around back to themselves. It makes it difficult when someone just really wants to be seen and heard. And this gives that opportunity. Virtual sessions over Zoom provides that opportunity for people to experience it. Eye gazing is a lot of fun to do. Uh, it can be a little intense for some people, but that also can be done over Zoom. And I enjoy it. I enjoy doing those. I know uh, you mentioned you were meeting with Sam from Snuggle with Sam, Sam Werner. And I think she had said in the past, virtual sessions, she's just not comfortable with them. They're not her thing. And I've heard other practitioners say, I don't really know what to do with them, but I, I really enjoy them. I also really enjoy connecting with people. I've not often met a stranger. So That is such a unique skill that so many cuddle practitioners don't have yet. How do you find a balance between catering to what your client needs, but also making space for yourself? Mm, that's an excellent question, Felicity. How do I find that balance? Well, I am very me. <laughs> so, you know, somebody uh, had said to me once, uh, a pra another practitioner, they're like, that could be really offensive. Or, you know, I think they were talking about the fact that I call new clients. I'll call them on the phone. I'll text and call sometimes if I don't hear back. And they said that could be offensive or somebody might not be able to handle a phone call with a stranger. And I said, well, then I'm probably not the right practitioner for them. I come in wholly me, exactly how I am with all of my offensive language, perhaps. <laughs> I'm not that offensive. Uh, I'm also very loud. I've got a big voice. I make inappropriate jokes. <laughs> Stuff. I had one client hugging me once. So I like real firm heart squeezes. One of my favorite. I'm a large person too. And uh, I said, Oh, don't squeeze me too hard. You're going to squeeze the pee out of me. And he started laughing. He thought it was hilarious. And I repeated it to some practitioners and they were like, you said that? And I was like, yeah, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> Most of the clients who see me, they enjoy the personality. And so because I am very much myself, it is easy to find that line where I can still cater to them, to what they need, as long as they communicate it to me. And as long as I'm also paying attention to their body language, because some people can't always communicate. But it's also the reason that I can only do like 10 or 15 hours a week. I can't do more than that. Otherwise, I am just exhausted. Well, I develop resentment for the work, but I can't show up for my children at home. I have three kids and uh, my friends. I have a very active social life with my girlfriends or my partner. I have to be very aware. And that was trial and error, learning how many hours I can hold space for somebody and be very aware and on it. I'm impressed. 15 hours sounds like a lot. I don't think I've ever surpassed more than 10 hours of cuddling. This is not including overnight sessions. Is that something you're offering? It is. Yeah, I do overnights and uh, the... <laughs> I'm laughing because you said there's a maximum number of overnights in a week. I have a maximum number of overnights in a month. Any more than two and uh, I'm unhappy. When I have to be on for 12 hours, 24 hours, listening, giving so much of my energy, I need recoup time. So that's another way that I take care of myself and I find that work-life balance. Again, this was trial and error. I was doing every week and I was just like, I'm pooped. <laughs> I can't do it. And people wanted multiple times in a week. And I did that once. And I was like, no, no way. And when I say multiple times, I mean, it was the same client twice in one week. Mm -hmm. That is a lot. And so I had to put really strict boundaries around that. So I only do two a month. That is a lot. Okay, so for me, overnights are normally, they start at 7.30 p.m. and then they end at around nine in the morning. I've attempted to do things the day I meet the client and then set up events or errands, whatever, the same day I say goodbye to the client. I need all the time I can possibly get right before and right after. I've tried and I always end up canceling whatever events I created. Whatever you had planned, 
later on. You're just like, no, I can't do it. I get it. I get it. That's a lot. It's a lot of energy and emotion that's being pulled out of you. A lot of attentiveness. Yeah, I completely get it. But I applaud you for the fact that you can do multiples in one week. I learned quickly that I couldn't. I've never done back to back days. And a part of me does wonder if I could fare well doing that. But now that we're having this conversation, I'm thinking maybe not. I would imagine it can be dubious if you have children. Like, how do you explain to your children that you're not going to be sleeping in the same house that night? Well, I only work when my kids are with their father, with my ex-husband. It's one of the reasons I love this job, this work. I used to have an electrical contracting company doing commercial residential construction. I had a lot of flexibility being my own boss in that business, but still I had to be up very early at five or six to be down in DC for whatever work we were doing. Sometimes I'd be there all day. I had a live-in nanny. I wasn't seeing my kids when I decided to close my construction company and just do this. You know, I recognize I was not going to be making nearly as much money or even close to it because construction is very lucrative in the DC area, probably in any city. So we're going to have to tighten our belts. But what I also really loved was that I could absolutely make my own schedule to see clients. And so Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays were my slow days. And those were the times that my kids were at home. And so I already knew I was going to be home when my kids were home. I was going to work while they're at school. Then they go to their father's every other weekend and and for two nights a week. And those are the times I see clients or I'm here in my office so I can spend a lot of time with my kids. It's important to me. My mother worked a lot. She was a corporate climber. My mother, single mom, four kids. And so I was often alone and by myself the majority of like my adolescence. And I didn't want that for my kids. It was a big deal for me when I finally made that decision that I wanted to be around and doing professional cuddling, already having a business background, knowing what I had to do to market myself and get my name out there, get in front of people. I'm a social person anyway. I'm an extrovert. I'm really comfortable going in front of a group and talking to people, mingling, you know, <laughs> I love to mingle, <laughs> which I know a lot of people don't like that, <laughs> but I do. I like learning about people and hearing their stories and what they're doing and what they're passionate about, what they're excited about. I do think cuddle therapy is a great job for extroverts. Introverts can also succeed. My father has been an electrical contractor for longer than I have been alive. So I understand the whole waking up before the sun rises and then having to spend so much of your day commuting and pretty much filling up your gas tank every other day. You are like the only person. <laughs> gets it. I always say construction is, it's tough, especially when it was my company. You know, it wasn't like my husband's or my father's, it was mine. And so I was out there doing the estimates, rallying the guys to finish before the inspection, crying in my car when the inspection didn't go through and I had to wait another week to get it. You know, saying, I, I have to drop my son off at daycare. I'll be right there. And anybody who's listening to this knows how inspectors are. <laughs> They're like, well, if you're not here, by the time I get there, I'm leaving and you're failed. Like you should have thought of that sooner. And it's like, ah, but I'm a single mom and I don't have any help here. And any job that requires a lot of commuting, like movers, they never show up on time, but you can't really blame them because there's always so much congestion on highways. We live in a car dependent country. I wish public transit was free and we don't have that. Electrical contracting is a very male dominated field. I sympathize with you. It's not easy working in a male dominated field, even if if you're the owner of a company. Yeah, I had to work a lot harder to prove myself. It was pretty funny though. There were times that I'd roll out the drawings and sit with the inspector, you know, at the city office and talk about what I'm trying to do, running these the different cables up to the 10th floor of a condo building or whatever. They would be surprised that I had the knowledge, the code knowledge, and they'd comment on it. And I think I, I always took it as a compliment, but at the same time, they were like, wow, a woman knows this stuff? I remember walking into a, a house had caught on fire. None of my guys could go in there and do and safe it off, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's just taking the burned wire to the nearest junction box and then putting wire nuts on it. So I had to go down there and I had all three kids in the car. This was a few years ago, so they were all still little. I'm like, okay, guys, here are your tablets. Stay in the car. You know, I was parked right next to the house. I was like, I'm just going to be in there. I'll be right back. And it wasn't going to take long. But the husband and this the father-in-law were sitting there and I walk in and there's showing me around and they show me the panel and I'm like okay I'm gonna grab my tools I'll be right back and I come back in and I start pulling stuff out of the wall <laughs> and the father-in-law says what are you the insurance adjuster or something 
I was like, no, no, I'm the electrician. A woman electrician, huh? And I said, that's how they're making us these days. They're making us women. <laughs> I just thought they were much older. He had to be in his 70s. That was what I dealt with. But I will say working with men for almost 20 years and learning how to talk to them, learning how to get them on board with what you're trying to do, not just the guys that I was writing paychecks for, but all of the other contractors, the HVAC guy, the plumbing guy, the drywall guys, you know, I had to be able to work and talk and negotiate with all of them. It helps me in what I do now. The majority of my clients are male. And so I am able to talk to them and get them to understand what I am saying. Very transferable skill. I would imagine going from a male dominated industry to a very woman dominated industry gives you a bit of whiplash. Like, wait a second, I'm the majority. Yeah, there aren't too many teachers. There's a lot of therapists that are women. I, I'm getting this information from Twitter. So I don't know if this is representative of the overall population. I've seen therapists on Twitter say they no longer accept male clients, and that is for uh, solo, so one-on-one -on -one therapy, and couples therapy, because a lot of their experience with male clients is men refusing to listen to the women around them, even women in authority positions. That makes me so sad, but I'm glad that they're able to choose whatever framework brings them peace. If I were to to throw my hands up and be like, I've had so many awful interactions with men, I'm just not gonna accept male clients anymore, I would be out of a job. Yeah, you would have no work. <laughs> But it's, it's crazy to think that, but I get it. I know what's funny too, when I talk to my male friends or partners that I, because I always encourage everyone to go to talk therapy, always they say they feel more comfortable sharing their deepest, darkest secrets with a woman than with a man. I don't get it. But then once they're in front of said woman, they don't listen. They don't want to hear what their the perspective. Mm -hmm. You're paying for perspective. You're paying for the understanding of this person and their knowledge. Perhaps we don't see people in therapeutic professions as authority figures. We see doctors and lawyers, those are authority figures, but then we don't take therapeutics as seriously as, you know, surgeons. This is my theory to the client. It's more of, oh, this is a friend that I talk to, but they invoice me. They sometimes invoice me. <laughs> Yeah, that could be. Now, I wonder if psychologists who are doctors also have that same thing, or if it's just master degree therapists. Does Dr. Felicity, you know, well better than therapist Jasmine? I don't know. Who knows? You've never done professional cuddling in California, correct? I When I went out to California in 2018 to get certified through Cuddle Sanctuary, I also saw clients out there. I've been doing professional cuddling since 2016. Started with Snuggle Buddies. Everybody says bad things about them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one of my clients, because I stopped after a couple of months working with them, and I had already developed a nice group of people that I was working with, client base. And one of them said, what about Cuddle Comfort? And I was like, what's that now? Cuddle Comfort? I'd never heard of it. So I went on there and it was great. I was able to talk to other practitioners and other cuddlers in a way that I hadn't experienced with the two months with Snuggle Buddies. I had told people that I was going to be out in California. I probably had it on my profile. And so people reached out to me and I scheduled some sessions while I was there. I think I only did like two or three. How does platonic touch therapy differ from California to Virginia to Maryland? Mm. Maryland, I should say that. I'm such a West Coast person. <laughs> That's okay. I would say, you know, here in the DC area, it is a mixing pot of cultures. I have all sorts of clients. I have African clients, uh, Hispan or uh, Latin clients, Central South American. I have Chinese, Korean, Amish. I have had two Amish clients. We're really a mixing pot, a melting pot of different cultures, different ways of people being raised, preconceived ideas of what a woman is, is what women and men do, what touch is, any religious factors brought into that culture. So I deal with a lot of that here. Also people here, most of the people here are upper middle class. Everybody's working. A lot of people are from different areas because people come here for work or for school, for military. So I do see a lot of people in law enforcement and military. I've seen people within the different agencies, but that's what is here in DC. In Southern Virginia, 
in, yeah. I would say the majority of my clients are white, cis, heterosexual men. Actually, all of them are. They are also primarily over 50. But Williamsburg is a retirement community, and a lot of people go there to retire. William and Mary College is there, so it's also a lot of college students. But I haven't seen many college students. I also charge $175 an hour. I don't know if that is uh, cost prohibitive to a struggling student. But I also get people who come from Richmond, which is an hour away, and uh, Virginia Beach and the surrounding areas, which is also an hour away. So I'm like right in the middle. But that was the goal to get both markets. I have a good client base in Boston. And there's a mix, I would say, of Indian and uh, white men, American, white American men that I see in Boston and um, in California. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. <laughs> So messed up. I one one gentleman was an actor. Somebody else, I don't remember what that person did, and then somebody else was was IT. It, I feel like it was so long ago that I can't even recall. And at that time, I don't think I took notes. I mirrored my business when I was growing. When I said, "Okay, I'm going to do Tanjay Wellness. How do I want my practice to be? How do I want to run this therapy practice?" And I decided, hence why I call it a practice, to mirror it after psychotherapy. I had looked at maybe yoga it after like a yoga or massage kind of studio but in the long run I thought marrying it after a psychotherapist type practice would help because also those are the type of clients that I was getting they were coming in here mm -hmm. with depression talking about suicidal ideations having PTSD CPTSD memories of severe abuse from childhood and that's also the reason why I started getting all of these mental health certifications and educating myself Myself because those are the clients who are showing up in my office. And I thought how irresponsible of me not to be able to talk the talk, not to be able to hold space for them, not to be able to recognize someone who's dissociating or who is not ready to touch. They're so wound up, they're fight or flight, that there's no way that we're going to do that. That's how I think I've developed my practice here in DC. That was so poignant. Oh my gosh. You mentioned earlier that you took a little break after you stopped working with Snuggle Buddies. Is that the only time since 2016 that you've considered quitting? No. Um, I didn't take a break after Snuggle Buddies. I just worked with the clients that I had that already had my, my phone number. I was still seeing clients. But there have been plenty of times that I've wanted to quit. And typically, it was based around not enough work, missing mortgage payments, uh, not being able to do things with my kids because it's expensive. It's expensive to have children. Also, there have been times I thought like around COVID that maybe I wasn't cut out for this. Maybe this isn't what I my life's calling. I've had people say, this is cute that you're doing this, but this isn't long term. You got to figure out what you want to do with your life. Hearing that over and over, I had a partner who used to say that to me. He wasn't supportive in that way. And it did start to weigh down on me. And I thought maybe he's right. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. But it is the reassurance of my clients who are like, thank you. Thank you you for being here. Thank you for offering this. You've changed my life. I've taken what I've learned in these sessions and I've implement, implemented them in my relationships. I've told, you know, my wife, she can't talk to me like that anymore. And I've walked out of the house. I've told my boss, I'm not available for you right now. And it's all from having, building the self-confidence in session, learning to love yourself, love the clients, learning to love themselves. There have been times that I wanted to give up. Now when I feel it or hear it going in my head, I quickly dismiss it and remind myself I freaking love what I do and I can't imagine doing anything else. And my kids, I love them. They're so supportive as well. You're so resilient. Yeah. I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> when you're 42, you'll be just like me. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully a lot sooner than that. <laughs> How did you come up with the name Tanger Wellness? You know what? Uh, I was trying to do a nod to my Mexican heritage. And I thought, you know, I didn't want to do Spanish, a Spanish word. So I thought a Latin word to touch. And I Googled it and I came up with Tanje. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but they have two different words. One word is to touch. And then they have another word to receive touch. I am going to do a rebranding and I keep putting it off and putting it off. But I'm waiting for the first of the year. And every time the first of the year comes, 
comes and goes. <laughs> and I'm still Tanjay Wellness. <laughs> so but that's where it came from. We've been doing this for years. And so we know that paid snuggles is not for everybody, but people can still be supportive of us despite having no affiliation with the cuddle industry. So how can people outside of our field be good allies to touch therapists? Mm, I love that. They can share our content, whether it's on YouTube, share this podcast, share Instagram, whatever it might be. They can talk about it at the water cooler to their friends, to their coworkers. They can, this is a big one. If somebody is in psychotherapy, if someone's seeing a therapist and also seeing a cuddler, connect the two so the therapist can then learn and understand. And then hopefully that therapist will send more of their patients to the cuddler. I am I'm doing a event on the 1st of June for therapists in the Fairfax area, which is Fairfax, Virginia. And I'm working with Pasadena Villa, which is a, I think they do both inpatient and outpatient work for perhaps people with addiction, uh, but not just addiction. Anyway, I'm doing a presentation for therapists and people in the mental health community so they can understand exactly what platonic touch therapy is, what professional cuddling is, how I, am, how I utilize the these different modalities of touch to create this safe space for people to show up and get the acknowledgement, the touch, the human connection that they need and that they want. Because I feel like people think professional cuddling, that just there's all these kind of, these associations with the word cuddle, which is also one of the reasons that I switched to platonic touch. Most people's experience with cuddling is either a prelude or postlude to sex. And I felt like it was just another barrier to get past, to get someone in inside my office um, to get a referral. So I know there are a lot of cuddlers out there who are really pushing the word cuddle and I love that and I think it's awesome. But I've decided to kind of go around it even though I still say I use professional cuddling in session. But I think that's one of the greatest ways to tell people about it. Thank you so much for speaking with me. I would love to interview you again. Where can my audience find you? First, Felicity, thank you so much for inviting me and having me here. I absolutely love talking about this. Maybe I can have you join me on Instagram and we can do an Instagram live, but that's the next best, best thing. And perhaps I can record it and also put it on YouTube as well. Best place to find me is my website, www.tanjaywellness.com. That's T-A-N-G-E wellness.com. I am on social media as well. So I'm heaviest on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on TikTok a little bit. I try to tweet once or twice a week. I do a lot of shorts on YouTube. Oh, I'll be releasing a 100 hour platonic touch practitioner course. One of the things I loved about Cuddle Sanctuary, my training with them was the camaraderie that I felt with the other practitioners, that there were other people doing this work when I hadn't really met anybody and who were doing it seriously. And so it was, it was wonderful. It's broken up into three modules. The, there's a business module because I think that's what everybody really needs, learning how to market yourself, figure out what you want your practice to be. There's the boundaries and consent module, the touch stuff, uh, understanding how we process touch as humans, and then the in-person module, which will be here in Maryland that I'm actually will be hosting. That sounds exciting. Please email me a photo that I could use to promote this episode and anything else you want me to put in the show notes, like a business email. That's about it. Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Sending you a big, big hug. Thanks again. Wow. What a beautiful person. I have not interviewed anyone for this podcast in over two years, and I just came back with a bang. I am so sad that the interview wasn't longer. Frankly, I'd have to interview someone for two hours straight in order to get a one hour final product. Be on the lookout for my episode on pro cuddling in South America. And like Jasmine said in the middle of our interview, be on the lookout for my podcast interview with Snuggles with Sam. Snuggles with Sam. My dear listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you're one of my patrons, thank you so much for supporting this podcast. Pro Cuddle Hustle is a passion passion project for me. Your patronage is not only supporting me, but the current and aspiring professional cuddlers and cuddle party facilitators who listen to Pro Cuddle Hustle. If you haven't already, please leave positive reviews on Good Pods. It's kind of like Goodreads, but for podcasts. You can leave reviews for individual episodes, but if you want to rate and review the podcast in its entirety, you can do so on Spotify, YouTube, Listen Notes, CastBox, Podchaser, and Podcast Addict. 
effect. Perhaps I'll read your review in a future episode. Please follow Pro Cuddle Hustle on all socials, Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, and Twitter. I'm the moderator of r slash professional cuddling. The subreddit has about 100 members, so please join. Tell everyone on your socials how important this professional cuddling podcast is. If you screenshot your review, put it on social media, and tag me, that will increase the likelihood of me reading your review. I also manage two different Facebook groups, Ask a Professional Cuddler and Professional Cuddlers and SW Only. Please only join the latter if you are a pro cuddler or a sex worker. My email address is felicityazara at gmail.com. I'm accepting cuddle bookings as always uh, this month of May. I will be in the San Francisco Bay Area in June. I have very little availability, but I do have availability in Baltimore, Maryland from June 15 to June 18. I charge premium rates when I'm touring. Screening and deposits are mandatory. Vaccination for COVID is required. Longer bookings will be prioritized. I accept deposits through Venmo, Cash App, and Patreon. Catch y'all later. You have been listening to episode 26 of the Pro Cuddle Hustle podcast. This is Felicity Azra signing off.